Welcome to Canonical, the podcast that takes academic discussion of literature out of the classroom. I'm James Shaw, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Iad Darris and Sam Spieler. Hey. Aloha. Hi, hi. Today we are continuing our discussion of The Dispossessed by Ursula K. Le Guin. This is the last book in our series of contemporary utopias. Today's discussion may contain spoilers. If you haven't read the book yet, we previously posted a spoiler-free review. You can find that in the archives. For this series, we also discussed Toni Morrison's Paradise and Mike Resnick's Kieran Yaga. If you're joining us for the first time, we are also a literary book club on Reddit. That link is in the episode description. And we are also on social media at Canonical Pod. So this week, I want to discuss two aspects of Le Guin's radicalism. As we discussed before, this was published almost 50 years ago and was pretty significant for its time. But while I think it's still worth exploring, I don't think it's as radical as it used to be and potentially wasn't in some ways even back then. Uh, the two areas I want to discuss today are Le Guin's views on language and on the heterosexual married traditional family unit. So let's start with the family aspect. On Urus, we are introduced to Vea, who at first seems free and different from her Urosti compatriots, but turns out to be just another object or possession. I think she is as illusory as the rest of the objects and desires on the planet, and she is supposed to be a stark contrast from Tokver back on Anaris. But Shevik's relationship with Tokver, as well as with his daughter, Sadiq, can hardly be called revolutionary. So what is this novel saying about the nuclear family? First, I want to ask you about how you see Vea, because you say that she is different from the other people on Urus in some way. And I'm not sure if she's really that different. What do you mean? I mean that at first she's supposed to seem that way in that she seems free the way people on Anaris are free with their sexuality. But as we find out later, that turns out to be not true, that that is a flirtation that is kind of an affect and it's it's a lie. It's a facade. So it's not that she is different, it's that she seems different at first. In terms of finding common ground here, do you think that she was truthful when she said that she is willing to copulate with him, but not at that moment? Like she would do it, but not there at the party? Because I took it as truthful. I didn't see it as her trying to not start an affair with him. I think she is interested in starting an affair with him. Yes, I do see her as truthful. I don't think she's lying about her interest in him. It's that she is not as free as Shevik thinks she is at first. She is just part of the machine on Urus. She doesn't exist separate from it. That to me seems, perhaps it's not to do with radicalism one way or the other, but it just seems quite keenly observed, because I do think that there are segments of the upper class who like to flirt with radical politics, but they flirt with it just as a costume. It's not a sincere belief in one thing or the other. So she is a married woman, but she's willing to sleep with Shevik, not because she believes in any sincere way that, you know, there should be free love or men and women should have open relationships or anything like that. For her, it's still a transgression. Her fundamental beliefs haven't changed. Whereas in contrast with somebody like Tokfer, Tokfer actually has a substantially different worldview from the people on Urus. So it's the difference between kind of an authentic set of beliefs and somebody who's just playing with them. I think you can also extrapolate that to what was going on at the time where you had people with very traditional views in the 70s about marriage, but you also had people who were, let's say, dabbling in swinging or in open marriages, which is kind of what Vea is 
doing. But you also have these very radical ideas of not owning another person in its entirety, like you were saying, Yed. And that idea is not just, you know, dabbling and swinging. Like, that kind of free love taken very seriously is very different from just, you know, someone going to a, a club for swingers. Well, when I bring up the supposed radicalness, who do you think I'm talking about when I bring that up? Because I'm not actually talking about Vea. You said that his relationship with Takfer and his relationship with his daughter can also not be considered revolutionary. So why not? So the whole idea behind uh, relationships on Anaris, and they don't call them relationships, they're partnerships, is that they can change at any moment. They are not marriages. It's almost like a convenience. Both of the, the both parties agree to linger and hang out with each other for an extended period of time. But it's very almost transactional, I guess, and egalitarian. That part is more revolutionary. However, Shevik's relationship with Tokfer seems to just be reiterating or re-strengthening the idea of a nuclear family. So it ends up bucking this revolutionary idea of simple partnership. I think that Le Guin does that to show that there is something in Shevik and perhaps in others that wants to stay with other people in the traditional family unit regardless of the custom of their society. Like, it's not easy for him to stay with this woman and his daughter, but he makes an effort to do it. Why does he make that effort? And I think that you're right that it establishes that family unit as something to be prized and something valuable, but I don't think that Le Guin does that naively. I think that she's making a point. I agree in that... We feel that it seems like she's arguing for the nuclear family because the protagonist is someone who wants the nuclear family. But what I think is interesting here is that she's setting up the situation where monogamy is not the norm. And it is, in fact, looked down upon because people think you're being selfish if you monopolize another person, if you own another person. But it seems to me that she's making a point, which is that perhaps monogamy might be part of human nature, insofar that there is such a thing. And how would this part of human nature be possible in a society that does not respect it or prize it? For me, that seems to be the tension here, which is that what if there are aspects of our life that is socially undesirable, but it's also part of who we are? Well, that's the reactionary aspect that I'm getting at. I think the tension is real, and I think it's worth exploring, but it doesn't feel radical at all to me. It feels very safe and conservative. Do you think that monogamy is something that is part of human nature. Like, I think to say that it is conservative is to say that it is not, that it is just one aspect of experience, and it is as true to human nature as polygamy. I think monogamy is the default, and I don't think it's negative. Uh, I think that is the typical mode for most of us, and... I don't want to put too much on this book because it's 50 years old, and I know I'm coming at this with more modern politics and more modern ideas, but it feels a little short. I guess I was just a little bit disappointed that in a book that is trying to be radical about so many things, that it ends up negating some of that radicalness by switching back to this. I think that where you've gone wrong is this way that you're valorizing being radical. If I can go off topic for a second, I've seen people on the right talk this way about vaccination and masks as well. People say, you know, leftists in the 60s were all anti-authority, 
And now leftists nowadays are all like, let's do what the government tells us to do. And I think that the problem with that kind of rhetoric is that it's saying doing something against what the government tells you to do is always correct in some point of view. And following what the government tells you to do is always wrong in some point of view. But I think that it's the same with talking about being radical or conservative. Being radical is good when you're radical for a reason, when there is something that you're going against that needs to be changed. So if you're making the argument that the novel is too traditional or that it's being reactionary, then I think that the burden would be on you to say, why is this something that needs to be changed? I think the radical part of this book is the societal structure that is set up on Anaris, where people don't have to be monogamous. And in fact, most people are not until later in life. Like for me, that is quite a change from how we live our life, even today, like 50 years after the 70s. Before I answer Eads, let me answer you, James, and it will bring Eads' point back around. I want to move on to uh, Bedap, their gay friend. I believe he's the only out gay character in the book. He also feels unconvincing to me and a bit reactionary. Le Guin takes the effort to create this character but I think he ends up being reduced to his lack of an inability to have a family. And again, this was written 50 years ago and is not the main focus of the novel, but it still felt lacking to me. For example, one part toward the end of the book, because of her father, Shevek, Sadiq is upset. Uh, she and her family have been labeled traitors. Um, and so she's crying and... Shevik is consoling her, and it's an obvious family moment that Bedap is uh, witnessing. He's standing near them. And so he leaves to leave father and daughter consoling each other. And as he's leaving, he's thinking about this, and he says to himself, 40 in a few decades, what have I done? What have I been doing? Nothing. Meddling meddling in other people's lives because I don't have one. I never took the time, and the time's going to run out on me all at once, and I will never have had that. I think there are different ways to read this, but to me it is reflecting on his life, and it's his inability to have a family like Shevix, because even if he is able to find a partner, he is not going to be able to have a child at least with what we know about their society. And again, I know I'm coming at this 50 years later, but it, it just feels like it's lacking in imagination. I think the problem with Badap and his homosexuality in this scene is that Le Guin is doing two things at once when she probably shouldn't have. When we typically think about gay men, we often think of promiscuity. and for Badap to have this thought in his mind, we are thinking that he is promiscuous and that has led him away from having a rewarding family life. But what I think he is trying to do, or what Le Guin is trying to do, is to say that he lacks this not because he's gay, but because he lives on Anaris. And it's not the custom on Anaris to have this life. That's also how I understood it, mainly because it seems like the focus is on work. Like in Anaris, you're defined by the things you do. That's the focus of Anaris. It's not who you are, where you come from. His sexuality actually doesn't matter at all. It's what he does. And he has not created a child. I also think, I mean, this is perhaps different and. Maybe I'm approaching it because I'm, you know, not gay, uh, and so I'm obviously biased. But don't gay men and women sometimes wish that they could have children? Like, not that they wish they were straight, but that they wish they could have children? Yeah, 
and there are solutions to that. I think you might be right about the focus on work, but I think there's an ambiguity here, and I think that ambiguity is the issue for me. I don't think the work aspect is the only aspect. You can do, we've already discussed before how you can do anything with your science fiction. So it seems to me that this is lacking in imagination to have have this character who is defined, at least in part, by his sexuality to be lacking in this way. I do agree with you in that I think the parameters of what it's like to be a gay person on Anaris is not firmly established. I think that's lacking because we don't really know what is available to him if he wants to have a child. We don't really know what being gay in Anaris is like. Like, we understand that it's socially acceptable, which I think is quite radical, given that this was published 50 years ago, right? Uh, before the AIDS epidemic. You even have Badap and Shavek coupling, even though, you know, Shavek, I guess, is mostly straight, but he is willing to couple with guys as well. So he's, you know, somewhere on that spectrum, not like entirely heterosexual. I think presenting that is pretty radical given the time. But yeah, I think the big fault here, something that you both mentioned, is that she just is not giving enough care to this. She didn't really portray what it's like to be gay on Anaris. It makes me wonder why is he even gay? Like, why have that issue at all for this character? I don't know if it's an issue, though. I think him not having a family and wanting a family is an issue. But, you know, as I said, him being gay is separate from that. I think the problem is that Le Guin doesn't see how readers like us would kind of conflate the two and see the problem with thinking of gay men lamenting their promiscuous, unproductive family lives. This might become apparent after the break, but I guess I'm just looking for more from Le Guin, even though this was written 50 years ago. Haters gonna hate. Maybe I'm being a, a little unfair. Do you mean that because this was written 50 years ago, it can't be as good as the radical politics that we find in fiction nowadays? Is this like, as time goes by, our politics get better and better? No, it's that there's a lack of imagination because she's writing from a perspective and we just have more information now. Our politics have changed such that there is more experience to draw from. That's all. It's not that this is bad or that things are better now or that books are better now. It's just that there's a lot more to draw on now. So I'm being a little bit unfair because I have the advantage of time. Some might say things have changed for the worst. <laughs> Impossible. Let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll look for other reasons to cancel Ursula Le Guin. Welcome back. So, Sam, you want to talk about Worf from Star Trek? Yeah, uh, that's exactly what I want to talk about. There's one other area of radicalism that I wanted to discuss, and that is Le Guin's ideas on language. There is something called the hypothesis of linguistic relativity, or James's preferred name for it, the Sapir-Worf hypothesis which is a principle suggesting that the structure of a language affects its speaker's worldview or cognition, and thus people's perceptions are relative to their spoken language. This novel is a prime example of an experiment in that hypothesis with Pravik, the language that is spoken on Anaris. Another well-known example is George Orwell's 1984 
where new speak is created to ensure conformity. Uh, so before we get into Provic, uh, let me explain a little bit more about this Sapir Whorf theory. So at its strongest, um, this hypothesis maintains that thought itself presupposes language, that we require a system of symbols to help us conceptualize and communicate. So it follows then that our experience would depend on the language through which it's expressed. So this theory or hypothesis was created in the 1920s in part by researching the Southwestern Native American Hopi tribes language, which prioritizes how it sees time, not as a linear sequence, but in relation to events that have occurred, are occurring, or will occur. So I think this idea of Pravik and this idea of Sapper Wharf, it's an interesting idea, especially that a civilization can be deliberately shaped with the help of a language created by the civilization's founders. But putting aside the Esperanto reminiscent question of how exactly would you get an entire civilization to switch languages, how convincing of an idea is this that Pravik was designed by the planet's first settlers to embed the shared belief system that makes their society possible? I would say it's very persuasive. I believe that it's possible. I think the question really comes down to how deeply you expect something to be embedded in somebody's mind because of the language that they use. Maybe you've heard of this idea in linguistics of GRU, which is that many languages don't have different terms for green and blue, but people who speak those languages still see and perceive green and blue differently. They just don't have language to express that difference. So at that level, language doesn't determine perception. But I think in the novel, what we're talking about is not really the way that they see color, but their attitudes towards behaviors and their attitudes towards ideas. And that, I think, definitely can be influenced by the language that you speak. I don't see a problem with that at all. All I know is that Wikipedia says that it's been somewhat debunked. Yeah, this, this idea is mostly debunked now. Linguistics has mostly decided that language does not come before thought. I think that there's a, a difference between saying that language comes before thought and that language influences mental content. It's quite clear that language doesn't come before thought because there are many times when we have a thought or a feeling and you especially, Sam, know what this is like when you struggle to find the words to express yourself. So I think that that's quite clear that we have ideas and we don't have the words for them ready. But if we act as if our thoughts are not influenced by the tools that we have available for us to express them, I think that that's a step too far. Now, I'm sure actual linguists will say that there is a more specific way that they're talking about this hypothesis and a specific way that they're refuting it. But just for me as a layperson, it does seem rational, especially for a monolingual person, to be very much influenced by the language he has available to him. I think you're right that we are influenced by our language, but... I mean, I, th I think it falling into disrepute is for good reason. I, I can't pretend that I know all of the linguistics studies of the day, but one of the refutes I've seen is from Steven Pinker falling in the footsteps of Noam Chomsky saying that languages, all languages are capable of expressing anything, that even if they don't have a word for something, like in your example, green, blue, if there's a need for that word, they can coin it if they want to. Every language can be, you know, expanded on. Uh, another example, like the, the Inuit languages, I think we've talked about how there's, what is it, like 17 words for snow or something in, in at least one of the Inuit language. It's not that English can't measure against that. We do just have the one word snow. 
but we have other ways of making up for that. You know, we have closely packed snow or powdery snow or wet, runny snow. Right. Actually, I had heard that your 17 ways of talking about snow is, I don't know if I want to say fake news, but it's kind of an urban legend. It's like German, where German is a synthetic language and you create new words by combining other words. And so they would have one long word that refers to densely packed snow and another long word, which is even more densely packed snow and so on. So it's kind of a, a shorthand for saying that these are different words when the ideas are just present in their language in different combinations. But I mean, I guess the utility is the thing like you have different ways of speaking when you have different reasons for speaking. And for people who spend a lot of time around snow, they have different reasons for talking about snow than we do. In the novel, though, I don't think it's so substantial because I think it operates, at least from my understanding, on a more surface level when they use certain words that seem to be neologisms, like they talk about people as proprietarians, and that's an insult in their mind. That, to me, I think definitely is possible, because I think it's being done here in China, you know? Like, the way people speak expresses an attitude, and in society, when you hear people speak and express a certain attitude you're more inclined to parrot that attitude. So it's much more to do with kind of the social use of language rather than an internal use of language. Yeah, I guess so. It becomes more of a social thing. But does that influence your actions? So I'm not a linguist, um, but as far as I understand it, uh, linguistic determinism it has been more or less debunked. The influence of language is not so strong so as to determine the way one thinks, but there is influence. And that's, I think, where you could ask the question, are Le Guin and Orwell kind of making language more powerful than it has any right to be? That, you know, that language can actually determine the way one thinks. And I think to answer the question first is, is that what Le Guin is presenting here? Like, is the language of Pravic or Pravich, like, is that actually helping determine the way people think, or is it just kind of influencing? I don't know if there's enough evidence for me to say either way. I guess I can't really answer that question. I think in 1984, though, uh, I think Orwell does make a point to say, like, the language is constraining the way people think. To get back to your broader idea here of radicalism, Sam, between those two options of influencing and determining... Which do you think would have been the more radical choice for Le Guin to take? I mean, I'm not Sam, obviously, but it's kind of hard to answer because... Wait, wait, wait. Are you sure? Because, like, uh, you know, this is like a cultural question when we talk about radicalism, right? The way that Sam is talking about it. But what we're talking about here is more of an academic question, you know, like, which is more academically radical? Hard to say. I think as lay people, though, we have intuitions about the way it works. And I think that our intuition would probably be that language influences thoughts, but it doesn't determine them. So if, you know, Sam is correct that Le Guin is trying to say that Pravic determines the way people on Anaris think, then that would be a radical opinion or a radical idea because it's very different from the way we normally think about language. Do you think there is enough evidence in the book to support the claim? I, I mean, I, I don't think so. I don't think there's enough evidence to support it either way, to say whether or not Le Guin is saying it's determining the way people on Anaris is thinking, or if she's just saying it's influencing, or it's a byproduct of the way people are thinking. I honestly can't really answer. I don't really know. But one of the reasons why I brought this up is I don't know if it's convincing either. Just the idea of it. I think it's an interesting idea, this created language, th this engineered language designed to get people to behave a certain way. 
I don't know if it's actually carried out effectively, though. The problem I'm running into is that I think if the book were actually written in this way, it would be really poorly written. I'll, I'll give you some examples of the rules that this language may have. Some years ago in England, there was a series of events to mark the 500th anniversary of Thomas More's Utopia. Speaking of Utopia, uh, the series of events was called Utopia 2016. And King's College London ran something that they called Night School on Anaris, where there was one set of uh, workshops created by a guy named Martin Edwards, who wanted to get people to try and speak and think like Anaresti people. So he came up with a set of rules, and I can point a link uh, in the description. People don't do things. Things happen to people. So you shouldn't think Shevik likes apples. Instead, apples are liked by Shevik. There's a lot more passivity. So you just always use the passive voice. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Or there is no I or me. Don't think I like apples. Think apples are liked by a speaker. The opposite of that would be it's not you like apples. It's apples are liked by the listener. There's also, you're not supposed to have words like give or have because that implies possession. There's all sorts of rules like that, and I don't think she follows them at all, really. Can I sort of set aside this question for a bit? Because the example that is most interesting to me is the use of my mother. And instead of my mother saying the mother, I mean, that actually puts it to the test because... If you teach a society to say the mother instead of my mother, do you think that would teach a child to not think of a person as their mother? I mean, that, I think, is the clearest, perhaps, argument of linguistic terminism or how she's presenting it. And I would say that, to my mind, it doesn't really work. Like, I don't think just because you change that word people won't think of that woman as their mother. Right. Even though in the book, it seems to be accepted to be true. For me, that is the biggest, that's the strongest argument you can make for Le Guin presenting it as linguistic determinism. But I think there are lots of examples where it's not. But I think the charitable way to look at it, and I'm inclined to be charitable, is that it's awkward, but awkward on purpose. Because... You know, Anaris is a society ruled by ideals, often with very little thought to how human beings interact with those ideals. And often there is conflict between human reaction and these ideals. And I think the fact that it seems awkward, again, might be deliberate. Yeah, it actually does circle back to this discussion of the nuclear family which is if you understand the nuclear family and the presence of it as uh, like when presenting the problems of this society, you know, you, you can kind of see how the language and the family kind of work together. One of the things I considered bringing up that we're not going to get into, but the central image of a wall is really interesting in this book. And that the whole difference between one society and the other can be expressed by what side of the wall you're on, what that wall looks like, and what that wall is doing. And I, I think that fits well with the possession and with the family unit as well. Sam, you have been making a case for this book not being as radical as you think it wants to be. But does the book actually make any sort of implicit promise or explicit promise that it is radical? I think it does. I think it is trying to be radical. I don't think it's trying to be radical about family. I think it's saying something about the human condition and how maybe the family is central to all humans. But in general, I think it is aiming for radicalism with almost everything else. 
On a very broad level, I think that there is a difference in our contemporary literary culture and the literary culture of 1975. What I'm thinking of here is the novelist that we read in our Nigerian fiction series, Akweke Amezi, and the way that they present themselves and the way that they present their work to the world. And that, to me, sets a standard for fiction that intends to be radical. And when I look at the difference between Le Guin and Amezi, there is a difference, but I'm not sure exactly what it is. I think Akweke Amezi is a very different kind of person to Ursula Le Guin. And I think the biographical details that I know of Le Guin's family life and her personal life show that in many ways she lived very much as a product of her times. Whereas with Amedzi, it seems that they want to be at the vanguard. Now, I don't know enough about the 1960s and 1970s to know whether or not Le Guin thought of herself at the vanguard or not, but it seems like the ability for a writer to be confrontational is much higher now. It's much more accepted for a writer to say, I am going to change the world. And I don't know if that's just writers being foolhardy or if it's a distinct attitudinal shift. There are so many different ways to be radical now, whereas this book is mostly clashing against political states. There are other things that it's clashing against, but that seems to be the, the biggest thing. That seems like a very easy thing to clash against versus Amezi's radicality is a much different thing. I kind of just disagree. I I think it is very radical. I don't know what it means to make a promise to be radical. I think the way the book is structured is to present a world that is more familiar to us, but skewered. That's Urus. And a world that's very unfamiliar to us and also critiqued. And I think because of that structure, we are meant to compare the two and we are meant to understand one world as being familiar and the other world as being strange. So I think there is some kind of implicit promise of a radical idea. Um, And I think it is actually radical because everything that we've talked about from language to family, I think is very different from the norm of that time, but also the norm today. Like this idea that you have a child and when they are four years old, you just give them to a learning center and you don't see them anymore. Like that's a very strange idea as someone who's a parent of a four-year-old. I agree with you in a sense, but I do think that there is a very broad idea that if we go back to the Nigerian fiction series, It reminds me of the difference between Akweke Amezi and uh, Chimamande Ngozi Adichie. I criticized Amezi for actually being quite middle class in her perspective. And with Adichie, I don't think that being middle class or not is a pejorative thing because she never made the claim to be a radical. She never made the claim to have a distinct and unusual way of looking at the world. So I think that these claims or promises, however you want to think of them, establish the grounds on which we can either praise or criticize an author. And I think it's fair to say that we don't know, but I think it's also fair to say that we could know or we should know. Yeah, I mean... At the risk of repeating myself, all the elements that we've identified as, quote, not radical or traditional, I see it as presented as a counterpoint, not because Le Guin believes in it, but because she is presenting no perfect system. Like, I think it would be one thing, uh, an entirely different book, to have Anaris with no problems, where you have no family unit, the main character is not desiring a family unit, where you had none of the issues that we talked about previously, and everyone just accepts 
this kind of lifestyle. Like that would be truly radical, but that is not the point, right? The point is that there is no perfect system. And I feel like to focus on this one aspect of the equation is kind of missing the forest for the trees. Yeah, I can get behind that. You should. It's a nice cliche. All right. Well, I got that final word in. So it's time to stop. We'll be back next week with further discussion of The Dispossessed by Le Guin. Thank you for listening. If you thought we were off base, you can come and let us know on Reddit. That link is in the episode description. You can also find us on social media at CanonicalPod. And if you'd like to support us, you can use our bookshop.org link. That's also in the episode description. If you'd like, you can give us a nice review on Apple or your podcast platform of choice. You really should, even if you don't want to. Yeah, you know, it's the nice thing to do. I'd do it for you. This is mutually beneficial. It's the thing to do. We'll be back next week. Till next time, happy reading. We'll talk to you soon. 